let's talk a little bit more about autism. Now, of course, it was referred to as ASD, right? Correct. Autism spectrum. At autism spectrum, spectrum disorder. disorder. Tell me today, how is the diagnosis of autism made? Because I think when many people think of autism, you know, if they're old enough, they might think a rain man, right? Yeah. You're going to think of somebody who in a very short interaction, a non-clinician would go, oh, that person is not neurotypical. That person clearly has something about them that's quirky and very different. And you might think of even more extreme examples of children that are nonverbal um, and things of that nature. But but again, given the nature of this and the fact that it's a spectrum, um, it, it, that must make it even more challenging to find the diagnosis, correct? Very, very. Um, so uh, I have so much to say about autism, right, about the diagnosis and how we make it and how it's changed so much over the years. Um, so autism spectrum. So first, it's a spectrum, huge spectrum of what those what this means, what people remember it from decades ago as from, you know, nonverbal, very little, you know, communication skills, um, being somewhat isolated, not interacting with other people, mannerisms such as flapping your hands, very, that's sort of a classic description that we do remember um, from, you know, over the last couple of decades. Nowadays, many children who have a lot of speech and language skills, who who are who do communicate a lot, but struggle with the social communication that we have with each other, um, who have many, many strengths, but do struggle with social skills and do have some restricted interests in repetitive behaviors, they also qualify under this umbrella term called autism spectrum disorder. And this term, autism spectrum disorder, that term came out in uh, 2013 with the DSM-5. So how we diagnose it um, is based on, again, clinical traits, but the definition and those and the checklists of those traits have actually changed many times over the mm. last few decades. So currently, it is uh, you work with an uh, an expert who has a lot of experience with autism, and they do an analysis of someone's behavior. Um, and the two areas that we look at are social communication skills, and the other is the repetitive behaviors restricted interests. So for social communication skills. Um, our current diagnostic criteria requires that a, that a patient has differences uh, in three specific areas. Um, one is their social reciprocity. So this is the um, back and forth of social interactions. It's how do you initiate socially? How do you respond socially? The second area is related to nonverbal communication skills. So it's how someone uses their uh, nonverbal communication, uh, eye contact gestures, as well as how they understand um, and interpret somebody else's nonverbal communication. Um, and then the third area is related to how they understand relationships. So it's about building friendships, playing with peers, um, uh, how they understand the social context of, of being in a group. Um, so those are the three key areas um, when it comes to the social communication piece. And in order to get the diagnosis, you do have to have differences in all those three areas. Is this something that is done during one assessment or is this something that's done over repeated assessments? Great question. Um, depends on the level of severity uh, in the child. Um, so first of all, it's important that whoever's doing the assessment really understands that child. Who in your clinical team yeah. does this? What type of training does this person have? Is it a physician? Is it um, uh, a social scientist? Like, yeah. yeah, great question. Um, it can be it can be a physician or it can be a psychologist. Those are okay. that's generally who does it. So physician it would either be a, a developmental behavioral pediatrician um, or a psychiatrist. That's most often. Occasionally, it's a pediatric neurologist um, or somebody else uh, in. Um, with some sort of similar background and training, um, but generally DBP or psychiatrist. And then, um, and if it's not a physician, then it's a psychologist that usually does the assessment. 
the assessment could be multiple things. Um, there's no uh, there's no gold standard like the assessment has to include um, certain components. But again, like as I mentioned, it's important that the clinician get to know the child. I think it's important to understand the child's profile. Like the label is only one piece of it. To me, if someone tells me their child has autism, I actually really don't know much about their child. Mm, say I, more. I, I, that, cause you tell me your child has autism. I have, I really don't know what your child is like if someone tells me that on the street. So, and again, like then we come up with treatment plans for like a child with autism. It's like, well, there's a saying, you've met one child with autism, you've met one child with autism. And so to really, you know, make a difference with mm -hmm. the treatment plan, you need to understand that profile of that child, that child's strengths and challenges. There's multiple goals with the assessment. One part of the assessment is to make a diagnosis um, because the diagnosis can be a tool to help the adults around that child better understand that child. It gives some sort of structure of like how to approach that child and leverage their strengths and um, and work on skill building. It can help get resources at school or through insurance. The diagnosis is a tool. However, to really make a difference, you want to understand what about that child is unique and different and how do you support that child? So you were asking, how do you do an assessment? So when it is a um, more significant case um, with significant impairments, we frequently can make the diagnosis, I'll just be honest, you can make it pretty quickly. Um, you, you should take a good history. You should mm -hmm. definitely meet with the child, work with the child in the clinic. But there are many children where a trained clinician can do that diagnosis pretty quickly in a child with very significant autism. Yeah. It'd be obvious to you if you were in a sure. restaurant, and you saw someone with autism, you know, it's obvious to many people. Yeah. Um, but for children who have milder symptoms, it is really important that... Um, that there probably is multiple visits to see the child on multiple days, um, that different types of assessments are done uh, directly with the child in addition to taking history with the parents and in addition to collecting information from other people involved in that child's life, such as teachers or therapists, uh, it's important to get different perspectives. So you mentioned that um, the diagnosis in, in sort of probably more severe cases can be made earlier and earlier in life. Sounds like sweet spot is three to four years of age, but then you said half kids are, half of the kids are diagnosed above six. Yes. So is that something that is a relatively recent phenomenon of the past decade since the DSM-5 broadened the inclusion criteria, or was that even true in the seventies and eighties? Yeah, great question. Um, so it, it's complicated. I'll say it has a lot to do with the new diagnostic criteria. So before 2013, we uh, had Asperger's syndrome. Yes. We don't use that uh, diagnostic label anymore. And we also had something called PDDNOS, pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, a mouthful. Um, and PDD. NOS uh, was a term we used um, when um, it it had simil similarities to autistic disorder um, because all three of those names were under the umbrella of autism. Um, and so there were a lot of kids who received this PDD NOS because they were like, Something's uh, different. Something's but different. They're sprinkled with bits of autism, but they didn't quite meet all the criteria. When you didn't meet quite all, all the criteria, you got PDD-NOS. And then there was Asperger's syndrome, which um, generally described an individual who had um, um, good cognitive skills, you know, average or high, high cognitive skills, intellectual skills. They had a lot of speech and language skills. They actually had huge vocabulary. Um, but again, their social reciprocity, back and forth conversation, picking up on social cues, that was uh, atypical. And they also had a lot of like restricted interests. Uh, they would have things they were really interested in, but then they would like dive deep into those things. Um, 
so in 2013 with the DSM-5, we put all of that together um, under autism, uh, or, or, sorry, autism spectrum disorder. Um, and so now the kids who have the more like clear cut, very traditional autistic disorder, they, you know, they're picked up at two years of age or mm -hmm. two and a half, three years of age. And it's the kids who have, you know, the stronger cognitive skills, the stronger they have speech and language present. Um, they're picked up later. By the way, nowadays with the new diagnostic criteria, um, language impairment may or may not be present in the diagnosis. So when you give the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, you also have to clarify whether there is intellectual disability, so with or without intellectual disability, and then we say with or without language impairment. So there, with all of these changes, um, the spectrum has, it's, a, it's, a, it's very broad.